Hi, Work Well listeners. I'm really excited to share that my book, Work Better Together, is officially out. Conversations with Work Well guests and feedback from listeners like you inspired this book. It's all about how to create a more human centered workplace. And as we return to the office for many of us, this book can help you move forward into post pandemic life with strategies and tools to strengthen your relationships and focus on your well being. It's available now from your favorite book retailer. I live with anxiety, and I'm not alone. In fact, according to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, 40 million Americans also live with it. Anxiety is a daily struggle for me, but one lesson I've learned from personal experiences is that you can't just focus on the neck up. You need to address holistic well-being and better understand the root cause of your anxiety to truly manage it long-term. This is the Work Well podcast series. Hi, I'm Jen Fisher, Chief Wellbeing Officer for Deloitte, and I'm so pleased to be with you today to talk about all things well-being. I'm here with Dr. Ellen Vora. She's a board-certified psychiatrist, acupuncturist, and yoga teacher. She's also the author of the book, The Anatomy of Anxiety. Dr. Vora takes a functional medicine approach to mental health, considering the whole person and addressing imbalance at the root. All right, Ellen, welcome to the show. Uh, Jen, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So tell us, I want to get to know you, have our listeners get to know you a little bit. Tell us about yourself. Tell us how you became passionate about mental health and you know why you, why you chose this field, and then we'll kind of dig a little bit deeper. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think I found myself in the position I'm in right now basically because I was an unhealthy and burned out med student. Mm. And in throughout medical school, I had these two parallel crises going on. And one was where I felt like I was being trained to masterfully medicate my patients and really being trained in the, the craft and the art of Western conventional allopathic medicine. But I had this unnerving sense that there might have been a better way then it didn't completely jive with my nature, which is to always think about prevention and to go upstream. Mm. And I felt like it was really teaching a reactive approach to health, which is terrific when things have already gone wrong. Um, And that's a beautiful aspect of conventional medicine is the heroics we can do when things have already gone quite wrong. But I just personally am more passionate about going upstream and preventing things from going wrong in the first place. And that crisis was happening in parallel with the fact that my body was like a machine with all of the springs popping out and nothing was working and I was doing everything seemingly right. I was eating what what my one half an hour med school lecture on nutrition told me was the right way to eat and I was exercising. Yeah, we need to fix that nutrition thing in med school, yeah. (laughs) Indeed. Um, And so, you know, I thought, why am I so unwell? It doesn't make sense and that required really going and doing creative approaches to research, not just um, looking to my attending physicians or my professors, but looking at other sources for thinking about how do we keep the human body healthy and well. And so those two parallel processes made me really take a different approach to health and that informs everything I do to this day with my patients. And so you're also an acupuncturist. So tell me a little more about that as well. Yeah, indeed. There was a phase in med school and then it it continued into residency where just really out of a sheer um, state of crisis and disenchantment with what I had been taught and the limitations of how I felt it could help with mental health, um, I wanted to pursue other approaches to health and healing. So I studied Chinese medicine and acupuncture and a little bit of Ayurveda functional medicine, nutrition, uh, probably a variety of other little modalities like a little bit of hypnotism and um, integrative psychiatry. And so all of that was born out of just wanting other tools. And acupuncture, I had actually never even experienced acupuncture when I decided I was going to study it, which is weird. Um, But I had a strong intuitive hit that this was something for me to understand. And once I got into that training, I was so glad I did because even just the act of taking an entirely different paradigm for understanding the body and human health was such a profound, um, it, it really helped expand my 
flexibility cognitively. And once you take on one new paradigm, I think it makes it easier to take on other new paradigms. And so it really helped me think differently about mental and physical health. Yeah, I, I love that. And the reason I specifically asked about um, acupuncture is I, I'm a breast cancer survivor. And when I was going through um, my, you know, kind of traditional treatment, chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, all of, of which, you know, w- was absolutely necessary to um, to to keep me here and keep me where I am today. Um, but I also, um, I'm not a medical practitioner by any sense of the word, but I did some of my own research and I started doing um, acupuncture during um, my treatment. And um, I think it was certainly life-changing for me and certainly in many ways, I believe, um, made my treatment a lot easier. So I was just very curious as to... Uh, to, to, to how you got into acupuncture Mm -hmm. as well, because I'm a big advocate for it. So, um, but you know, as, as you were talking, I mean, and, and you talk about this in your book, you know, you take this whole person approach to, to mental health. And I want you to talk a little bit more about that because I think for so many of us, myself included for a really long time, we're kind of taught to believe that the brain and the body are different, right? That like what happens above the neck is something different than what happens below the neck and that somehow they're disconnected or not connected. And right. So there's like, there's mental health and then there's physical health, but really the truth is, is kind of what happens in the brain happens in the body and and vice versa. So can you talk more about that? Mm, Yes. And I didn't know that about your health history and, um, and I appreciate your sharing that and I'm so glad you're okay. Thank you. And it it just uh, compulsively, I want to address one aspect of that and then also answer your (laughs) question. Absolutely. Which is, is, um, you know, it's, we are so all or nothing in our thinking and and we think that it has to be one or the other. And and you're a perfect illustration of how these can complement each other. Like you can say yes to all of the incredible advances that have happened in the conventional realm of oncology. And you can also get acupuncture. And, um, and it doesn't mean you're, um, you know, sort of flouting the advances of Western medicine. And I think that if nothing else, acupuncture reduces stress in the body, it tips yeah. the body into a parasympathetic nervous system tone, which is a precondition for healing. Mm-hmm. We heal, you know, if you learn in high school biology, rest and digest and relaxation, we also call it rest and repair. When we're in the parasympathetic tone, which is the opposite of the fight or flight sympathetic tone, that's when our body can engage in housekeeping and healing. And modern life doesn't allow a lot of space for the parasympathetic tone. And acupuncture, at the very least, at least tips you into that state and you can maintain that for a while. And that's if we're not even also recognizing potential psycho-spiritual realms of where we develop illness, where we develop blockages. Um, And that's sort of the more rarefied aspect of Chinese medicine. But I I sort of, I find it all to be really eye-opening in an interesting way of understanding health. Absolutely. Yeah. When, when I, when people ask me about acupuncture, I'm like, listen, if nothing else, it's going to force you to like lay there and do nothing for like 45 minutes because you have needles in you. (laughs) 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 So you can't move, right? So like if, if, if there's no other reason, then you just need to go somewhere and like lay and relax and like have a reason not to move. There you go. (laughs) You want to be multitasking. Exactly. But you can't. On your phone, you cannot. (laughs) Yep. Yep. And yes, that's right. So to, answer your actual question about a more holistic way of of thinking about the body. I mean, you're exactly right. Mental health, we have been taught to think about it really from the neck up, that we think our mental health is contained to the cranium and everything relevant to it is happening in the brain and it has to do with our brain chemistry and our thoughts. And there is validity to that. I'm not here to throw the baby out with the bathwater or discard all of that. I just think that we owe it to the population of everyone struggling with mental health to pan out a bit and widen our lens and think a little bit more comprehensively and creatively because the real determinants of our mental health certainly include our genes. I suppose they include our brain chemistry, but we'll drop a pin on that for a moment. And they also, these determinants of our mental health also include the quality of our sleep, our nutrition, how we're moving our bodies, whether or not we are inflamed, the balance of our hormones, um, all the way beyond the physical body to certain psycho-spiritual aspects of our health. 
the fact that we cannot avoid, we're human beings with certain fundamental needs for community, for a connection to nature, a sense of meaning and purpose in our lives, I think even to be of service and make our contribution. So these are also pertinent to our mental health. Mm -hmm. And that can feel overwhelming sometimes because it's like, well, I thought it was just my genes and there was nothing I could do about it except take a medication. But I, my hope is that when we expand the menu of offerings, that that can actually be empowering and give people reason for hope. Because many people, when you focus on just the genes and brain chemistry, for some people, our current offerings of treatment have been sufficient and they've provided adequate relief. And that's great. I count that as a victory. But that's not been true for everyone. And I think a lot of folks are feeling pretty disenchanted, even demoralized. They think, well, that's those are the treatment options and they haven't worked for me, so I'm stuck. And I want those folks to know there's still reason for hope. There are so many more avenues to explore to support your mental health. And genes matter, but it was only ever a predisposition. And there's not a whole lot we can do about our genes, but there's so many actionable things that we can do with regard to the environment that's bathing our genes. And that's where I think we can feel empowered to support our own mental health. And that pin I dropped on the brain chemistry is that there's been a lot of focus on brain chemistry. We describe mental health issues as a chemical imbalance, but we now have this really interesting meta-analysis that came out last summer mm -hmm. around how um, you know, there's actually never really been a robust evidence basis for the idea of low serotonin contributing to depression. Right. But I think that even the extent to which brain chemistry is relevant to mental health, I've always suspected that it's a downstream effect of all of these other upstream root causes of our mental well-being. First of all, I love everything that you said. And it just, I mean, it kind of, it to me, it makes so much sense especially if you kind of look around in our world and the number of things that are impacting our mental health. And so I guess, what do you think the state of mental health in America or just globally is today in the context of the way you just described it, right? Because again, I think generally it, it seems like we're not moving in the right direction, unfortunately. Mm, that's well said. Yeah, there has been that we were already in an epidemic of mental health issues prior to the pandemic. And then, of course, rates of depression and anxiety have precipitously risen in the last few years. And um, I mean, on the one hand, that's just grim. That's um, we have a big problem on our hands and accessibility and affordability of mental health care really are at an all time fever pitch problem right now. Um, but I think that it does just further corroborate the idea that we need to move away from this idea that our mental health issues are a genetic chemical imbalance because genes don't change in the course of five years. Um, we have had such an incredible uptick and this just keeps pointing such a fluorescent arrow at environment. Mm -hmm. And our environment is really tough on mental health right now in a number of different ways. And some of the well-worn things that we look at are things like social media and burnout with work. Um, I think that we're maybe just beginning to appreciate how we are so chronically sleep deprived as mm -hmm. a society. I think that one is really impactful, really significant, and quite actionable. It's one of my favorite things to treat, and we can talk about strategies and sort of pearls to help people with their sleep. I think nutrition is a fraught topic because it matters to mental health. So that alone for some people is a bit of a paradigm shifting idea to say, wait, yeah. you know, what I eat is going to impact my mental health. Um, but then we get bogged down in really um, – a lot of warfare on the internet around this is the right way to eat, this is the yeah. wrong way to eat, don't tell me what to eat, sort of all of this shame and baggage and scar tissue wrapped up in choices around eating and even that we emphasize this at all. So that's a big topic to unpack. Um, I think that without any of those kind of m moral layers to it, we do have to recognize that the brain is this piece of flesh. It's an organ like any other part of the body. And it requires certain raw materials to function well. And so if we want good mental health, that means we need healthy brain function. And to have healthy brain function, our brain needs 
minerals, vitamins, nutrients it, that we get it from our food. And we are operating in a nutritional landscape that's relatively nutritionally bankrupt. And so what we need to do is reclaim how we approach feeding ourselves. It needs to be with an eye towards nutrient density. And, um, and I think a really important balance to strike there is not to do that from a place of fear or feeling fragile or letting meal prep become an obsession and a part-time mm. job <laughs> from a place of ease and pleasure and uh, affordability and convenience, but really at self-love as the operating system that we make our food choices from a place of radical self-love. Yeah, I, I, I think that's so powerful and that really resonates with me. I, I want to not necessarily shift gears, but... Um, you know, talk more specifically about your book. Um, and it, your book is called The Anatomy of Anxiety. So tell me why you decided to focus specifically on anxiety. I decided to focus on anxiety for two main reasons. One was uh, that whenever someone walked into my office, uh, anxiety seemed to be a pretty recurrent theme. Um, so I saw the scale of the problem and there was a lot of unmet need. Uh, both on social media platforms or where I was engaging with, um, you know, a population there, but also in my own private practice. And then the other factor is that I really like treating anxiety. I find in contrast to a lot of other mental health issues, which are a little more challenging to treat, there are a lot of quick wins with anxiety and what I would consider a lot of low-hanging fruit aspects of how to approach anxiety that we're not, we're not thinking about it correctly yet. And it only requires a little bit of opening our eyes to new strategies, and then you can bring somebody an enormous amount of relief relatively quickly and easily. So that's fun for me. And um, yeah, I mean, it was just a book I felt like, well, I thought I could just write this in my sleep, <laughs> which you know may have been true for the first draft, but then <laughs> there's a process, as you know. Um, and I think that uh, you know that's that's been true is that. Um, for me, I, I thought the big part that we've been overlooking when it comes to our mental health is that the physical body plays a role in our mental health. There's a colleague of mine named Will Cole, and he, I believe he says, um, mental health is physical health. Like, we just need to own that. And we can't really support our mental health adequately without focusing on the balance of our physical body, our physiologic balance. And with anxiety, there are a lot of little ways that our body gets tipped out of balance and it triggers a stress response and that creates the experience of anxiety. And it's creating a lot of unnecessary suffering. I think of this as avoidable anxiety. In the book, I refer to it as false anxiety, right. which through the course of the book tour, I've recognized lands a little triggering and invalidating. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, I don't mean this at all to um, dispute the very real suffering of this type of anxiety, but really just to point to the fact that there's a straightforward physical basis for it and a straightforward path out of it. So this is the stuff of avoidable anxiety. We can do a survey of ways that we might be out of balance, address that at the root, and eliminate a lot of unnecessary suffering. So um, I, I wanted to dig in more in to the, the topic of false anxiety or avoidable anxiety. But I guess before we do that, um, can you can you define for me like like you know a few things about anxiety? Like what like what is it and what is it not, right? Because I, I actually think there's probably some confusion there. Um, and then like how common is it? What causes it? Like kind of take us on that journey, but then I do really want to talk about avoidable or false anxiety because I, I read your book and it really resonated with me. It didn't trigger me. It actually was very enlightening to me. Like, oh, okay, wait, <laughs> that makes a ton of sense. This is this is what I'm experiencing. So I do want to go down that path, but I, I think kind of stepping back and and helping people understand what anxiety is, what it isn't, and what causes it, and how common is it. Yeah. And I mean, that certainly my hope is that it, it's <laughs> resonant and gives people uh, hope and a feeling of, okay, you know, there's something I can do about this and I can be less anxious. But it doesn't always land that way the first time around, which I get. We can unpack that a bit. I've experienced that myself, even when someone pointed out one of my false anxieties. <laughs> I was like, hey, you know. Well, we all have them. <laughs> my stressors are real. What do you mean? Yeah. Like, you're invalidating what's bothering me right now. They're like, no, but maybe 
less coffee and then let's see how much it bothers you. <laughs> and so it was true. Um, so I think that, you know, I have bristled with the question of what is anxiety throughout this book tour <laughs> and I haven't made any progress toward having a better answer. There are themes of anticipating a potential negative consequence, themes around uncertainty, control, all of this is relevant to anxiety. But I think part of the reason I bristle at the question is that we are so of a cultural moment where we think the word anxiety, it says something about our identity, mm -hmm. that it's a, a permanent state, a fixed trait, um, and, and something genetic and sort of handed down on high. It's our destiny. And I just don't want to participate in supporting that way of thinking about it. I think anxiety is a um, it often temporary subjective state of worry and really a, the the kind of subjective experience of a stress response in the body. And there's so many things that can cause that. And some are our stressors and some are physical states of imbalance. And so, and in the book, I try to ap approach it with a new system of nomenclature, a new categorization, rather than what I was taught, which was to think about anxiety as generalized anxiety disorder or panic disorder with or without agoraphobia and OCD and so on and so forth, I thought the most meaningful distinction and what steers management in my practice is to identify two types of anxiety, what I call true anxiety and what I call false anxiety. And false anxiety, it, it, especially if that term doesn't feel good, it's interchangeable with avoidable anxiety. It's based mm -hmm. in the physical body. It doesn't serve us. It's not our deep inner truth. It doesn't need to be happening. Nobody wins with false anxiety. And to the extent that we can identify what's causing it and address that and reclaim a state of balance, we can walk away from all of that unnecessary suffering and just feel better. And then true anxiety, on the other hand, is not something that we should be pathologizing. It's not something to suppress, and it's not something that we could gluten-free or decaf coffee our way out of. It's in many ways our true north, an inner compass that's nudging us and urging us to slow down, get still, and pay attention. There's usually some kind of call to action baked into it where it's, it's basically saying, you know this, but you haven't slowed down to really know this, but there's something, some area of your life or the world around you or your community where something's out of alignment and you're being asked to do some form of a course correction. And it can be so minor. It can be so grand. You know, it could be that, you know, there's some activism cause that you're meant to step into the front lines of, and it could be that you're supposed to call your grandma more often mm -hmm. and everything in between. But that true anxiety is a state of uneasiness that pertains to something very real, very valid. And once we listen to it and honor it and transmute that feeling into purposeful action, we don't feel quite so anxious. It feels like we are then imbued with purpose and we're, there's momentum and we don't just feel mired and stuck in our anxiety. And, and you talk about this in the book that – understanding true and false anxiety or being able to navigate or identify, um, you actually talk about it as a superpower. Um, anxiety is a superpower, which like my whole life I've lived with anxiety and I've never thought of it as a superpower. <laughs> <laughs> so of course I loved being told that I now have this incredible superpower. So can you, can you tell me more about that? <laughs> And I'm, I'm truly not just pandering to you. No, and, you're not, and I don't mean to be making light of it. It was, <laughs> it was so, it was, it was actually very empowering for me to, to kind of change the way that I looked at it as something that there's always been something wrong with me or why can't I just overcome this or why can't, I mean, like, you know, especially when you have anxiety, when people in their, in their best interest are always like, well, just calm down or just stop thinking about it or just do this, all the justs that you get. Mm. Right. And like you, when, when you have anxiety, you live with anxiety. Like I, over time, I think learn to just not express it. Cause I didn't want to hear people telling me, oh, well just do this or just do that. And so honestly, when I read your book, it was, it was really empowering. Cause I was like, oh wait, what, well now I don't have to like 
hide this or be ashamed of it. Like I have new, a new mindset and new tools and new ways to actually think about it and deal with it. Mm. So I don't mean to be making light of it at all. No. I just love the fact that you told me I had a superpower. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'm, I am so emphatic about that, partly to push back on the ways I think culturally we've been getting this wrong. Yeah. So there are so many ways that we exist on these spectrums, you know, dualities. There's yin and yang and masculine and feminine. And I think there is um, there is a spectrum of being more or less sensitive. And our culture will always place value on one end of that spectrum and not the other. And, you know, we're living in a moment of, I would argue, yang and balance where we we value productivity and we devalue rest and mm-hmm. receptivity. Um, and I think that when it comes to sensitivity, we've ha- we've been in a moment where we say, don't be so sensitive, just as you say, you know, just pull up your bootstraps and get it together. Um, we've been shaming anxious folks for ever and, and saying, don't be like this. And we've gotten it wrong. So n- nobody's better or worse than anybody else, but we exist on a spectrum. And we need all types of people. We are omnivorous by design. And one person is unflappable. And thank God for that person. We need them as a pilot or a surgeon. We need their steadiness. And in the same breath, we have someone else on the other end of the spectrum who can't watch the news without crying, who viscerally feels connected to the suffering of all sentient beings in the world. And they will sometimes struggle in this very loud world, but that is not a worse state of being. It's a very vital function that they serve. And so I encourage people with anxiety to recognize it's a liability because our world is very loud. You know, this mm-hmm. is a form of being sensitive in every sense of the word. You're sensitive to other people's emotions. You might be sensitive to gluten. You might be sensitive to crowds and loud noises. It's sensitive in every sense. And that's a liability because our world is noisy, but it is also an asset. And and I think that the sooner we can embrace that, both the people who are struggling with anxiety can embrace it for themselves, but the people around them can also recognize, rather than saying, like, stop being so sensitive, can we tell the anxious folks, like, tell me what you know? Because I think when somebody has a lot of true anxiety, this is not what's wrong with them. This is very much what's right with them Mm. when they are viscerally connected to what is wrong with the world. I think to be, you know, this is maybe a little superlative, but I think they are sometimes here in a prophetic sense. They are tuned into something that the rest of us might not yet be noticing. So let's talk about that kind of specifically in the workplace, right? Mental health, um, you know, for a long time was something that didn't get talked about at all in the workplace. And people were even afraid in some sense to use resources if they had any provided to them. I think maybe because of the pandemic um, in a lot of ways, you know, there, there has been much more of an openness and and a focus in the workplace regarding mental health Um, And more and more companies are providing great resources for people. But when we talk specifically kind of about anxiety and and what you were just describing, how how does that come to life in the workplace? And how can teams like teammates, colleagues, leaders actually lean into those different ways of being or different ways of thinking and seeing the world um, with our with our teammates and with our colleagues? Mm. I think that there is this beautiful movement happening right now where yeah. we're destigmatizing mental health. We're talking about it more. Gratitude to the younger generations for really ushering in Absolutely. that conversation. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and I think that we have to get real about a fact of life. Like in certain ways, there was an untaxed benefit that corporations got in the past, which was we're going to work you really hard and you're going to get burned out and then your problems are going to be yours to deal with. (laughs) It's not our problem. And I think that we are, you're increasingly seeing companies basically not only care about, um, you know, the sort of most precious capital, which is the people and, and care about their well-being, but also even recognize that for the functioning of this overall organism of a, com- of a company, uh, we need good morale. We need people to feel that their needs are met. We need less turnover, less burnout. And so really everyone benefits when employees' needs are met. 
And so we're talking about it now, finally. How do we fix this? I think that there's the simpler, hand wavier <laughs> explanations, like, you know, we, we create space for talking about it, we build in breaks, we set boundaries, we have, um, you know, time off, and we per- participate less in the 24 7 responsivity culture, um, you know, and top down modeling of that. I think there's all of that is impactful. And I think that there are bigger questions to ask right now about um, how do we truly keep ourselves intact while making a meaningful creative contribution. And, and I think that, you know, I think the sky's the limit in terms of how we can rethink the balance of how, how much are we working and how much are we resting. I know that we've got that balance slightly off right now. I think the question is how much off? Um, but I, I really look back to the wisdom of Taoism and the symbol of the yin yang, which always appreciated that that yang or masculine or sun or doing energy exists in a 50 50 dynamic equilibrium with the yin aspect of resting and non doing. And um, we are in a culture that is obsessed with yang and productivity. And um, we, we devalue yin and we're all burned out. And so perhaps part of the strategy to go forward is to value rest in its own right and not as a function of our productivity. When you catch us being like, I'm going to pick up a meditation practice so that I can be more focused at work. Mm -hmm. There's something kind of, you know, that's, that's yang and yin's clothing. So I think (laughs) that you want to really actually start to fiercely and unapologetically defend and protect your rest and your leisure for its own sake because we are inherently worthy of, of rest and leisure. And then to fly in the face of what I just said, you know, yang and yin's clothing, it does actually end up making us more creative, mm-hmm. more motivated, more engaged. We are happier, more intact humans. And I think that there is an important insight to recognize here, which is that, you know, maybe Sigmund Freud got a few things wrong, but I think he got it right when he recognized that happiness is foundationally built on to love and to work. And we feel good when we are industrious and when we are making a meaningful contribution, but we just have to do that from a place of balance. And um, and that's where I think we're all rethinking what does work look and feel like? How do yeah. we feel satisfied but not overstretched? Right. And it's very hard to make a meaningful contribution on any sustainable basis if you aren't resting. Yes. Um, anybody that's been burned out can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I want to kind of end our conversation today and, um, and, and talk to you about maybe there's some simple daily habits, even some not so simple daily habits that people can, can, you know, can try, um, that people can do to increase, you know, their, their mental health, their mental wellness to manage anxiety. I know before, You mentioned um, talking about sleep, which happens to be one of my favorite topics to talk about. So I'm happy to to dive into that. But what are, I want to get tactical here Mm -hmm. and give people some things that they can really do or try or do differently. It's it's my favorite conversation. (laughs) But the first half of my book, the actionable Mr. Fix-It approaches to anxiety. So I do start with sleep as well, um, partly because, you know, some of the things we might get into, like caffeine, gluten, alcohol, nobody wants to have that conversation. (laughs) But sleep, we want to sleep. We have have shifted as a culture. We no longer think, ah, I'll sleep when I'm dead or sleep is for the weak or the lazy. We want to sleep. I think to the credit of people like Ariana Huffington, we've really had a shift where we recognize sleep is critical. It is our secret weapon. So now we're doing all the right things and sleep still eludes us. And Mm. that's infuriating. Um, And so I really love to tackle the issue of sleep. And my central thesis when it comes to improving someone's sleep is to see this through an ancestral lens that your body wants to sleep. It knows how to sleep, but we do have to give it the right inputs and not irritate the system. And this centers most of all around light, light Mm. cues. And basically, this was a system that evolved over millennia on the proverbial savanna of evolution, where light caused us to release cortisol, and that made us feel awake and alert, and darkness allowed us to secrete melatonin, and then we were able to get sleepy. And that system was foolproof uh, until we harnessed electricity and you know we, we got the light bulb, and eventually the, 
phone and the social media platforms and now nobody sleeps anymore. <laughs> so um, what we need to do is fix our light cues. And mm-hmm. I think it's so powerful to recognize our body, the way it has a 24-hour clock is based on light cues. There's a part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus and it is connected to the eyes and constantly scanning the landscape to, for light to understand what time of day it is. And if you were just in nature, it would see the sunrise, it would see solar noon, it would see the sunset, it would see the darkness, it would see the waning moon and the full moon and the waxing moon. And all of this would set a clock, both a daily clock and a monthly clock. And that helped us, it helped our bodies maintain its own rhythms. And these days we are indoors during the day. If we're working from home, we might not go outside at all. And then in the evening, we're surrounded by the psychedelic light show of modern life with screens and overhead lighting and ambient light pollution outside our windows. And then, of course, we bring our phones into bed with us and it sits on our bedside table. We glance at it when we wake in the morning or when we wake up in the middle of the night. And so all of this is suppressing our melatonin and disrupting our circadian rhythm. And we can correct those cues. It starts first thing in the morning with a circadian walk to make sure that as early as possible, you're getting actual sunshine into your actual eyeballs to start the clock. And then after sunset, it's really critical to block blue spectrum light from getting into your eyes and suppressing your melatonin. So you can achieve that by moving off the grid and homesteading and raising chickens and defenestrating (laughs) your phone into the ocean. Um, Or you can just get a pair of blue blocking glasses And I love all the things like flux on the computer, all of the different modes you can do on your phone, like night shift mode or night mode. Those are great, but I think that they are um, necessary, not sufficient. And what really makes the difference is a pair of blue blocking glasses that will block all blue spectrum light from getting And they make some really cool looking blue blocking glasses. (laughs) They used to be like these big clunky things that maybe only your grandfather (laughs) would wear, but now they make some really cool ones. That's exactly right. (laughs) I'm actually still going strong wearing the ones that make me look like I'm about to do metallurgy. (laughs) But (laughs) if you want to look normal and trendy, you can these days. You have that power. There's no excuse. (laughs) Um, And so I think the use case for most of us us is to just put them on at sunset, wear them till bedtime as mm-hmm. a rule. And that goes a long way to protecting our sleep. And perhaps the next best thing is to just also pilot not bringing your phone into the bedroom at night. Yeah. You don't keep it on your bedside table overnight. You set up your charger somewhere else, kiss your phone goodnight at a reasonable hour, and then you enter your bedroom phone free. And that's protective of sleep along a number of dimensions, protecting you from the attention economy and the endless scroll without a natural stopping cue, um, from the blue light, from the fact that when the world is a mess, we can feel surrounded by danger. And it makes it really hard to surrender into sleep. And I think as the activist Brittany Pagnett Cunningham says, we need rested warriors. So if we want to show up in a vital way for everything that's wrong in the world, we need to protect our rest. Couldn't agree more. I love that. Thank you. Any other quick daily habits or things that people can do to increase their mental health and well-being? I mentioned that we didn't want to have the conversation around (laughs) dietary intolerances, alcohol, caffeine. I guess I'll say the very lightest touch on a couple of these things, which is that with caffeine, no shame. I'm not throwing shade at caffeine. I just think that We do have a lot of bio-individuality when it comes to caffeine tolerance, and some of us are slow metabolizers, which means we're very sensitive to caffeine. So we are pretty jittery and hopped up when we consume caffeine. And of course we do because it's a very, it's 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 a real drug. It has a real physiologic dependence, and we wake up every morning in caffeine withdrawal. So coffee, of course, feels like our one true friend in the world and our salvation. It is, of course, just correcting a problem it itself caused, but it's, you know, I can understand why we love it. Um, But if you are someone who's sensitive, maybe you just decrease the overall amount by switching in with some half-calf or to black tea and pushing it a little bit earlier in the day to protect your sleep because caffeine has a long half-life. With alcohol, I'm one of these people that is compelled by uh, scientific explanations and For me, what actually moved the needle for me to make different choices around alcohol was to recognize that part of the reason we like alcohol is that it rushes our brain with a neurotransmitter called GABA, gamma immunobutyric acid. 
And that's very relaxing. It's our primary inhibitory neurotransmitter of the central nervous system. So it makes us feel calm. And if the story ended there, I would say alcohol is a great treatment for anxiety <laughs> and insomnia. Um, but the story, you're right. <laughs> it doesn't end there. And, and our brain, our body doesn't really care whether or not we're relaxed. It's concerned with our survival. So it sees all that GABA and it thinks we must reclaim a state of homeostasis or that original state of balance. So it achieves this by converting the GABA to a different neurotransmitter called glutamate, which is actually quite excitatory and activating. And I believe this accounts for why when we've had a few drinks at dinner, inevitably we wake up at two or three in the morning and then we proceed to toss and turn and feel kind of racing thoughts and an I agitated say, my feeling. My heart's usually racing. Yes, <laughs> yeah. exactly. And so we have lousy sleep. It disrupts our sleep architecture. And that contributes to really every mental health struggle under the sun, just that, just that impact on sleep architecture alone. Mm -hmm. But I think that that GABA to glutamate conversion cumulatively over time has a real impact not only on anxiety or the hangover anxiety the next day, but even cumulatively over time. And so I think that with alcohol, this is such a tricky pickle, but the more that we can just make a choice once again from a place of self-love. Is tonight a night where savoring a glass of wine with a special meal is the act of self-love? Okay. Or is tonight the night where ordering a seltzer with lime is the act of self-love? And just to make sure we're making those choices consciously, eyes wide open, and not from a place of mm, feeling peer pressure or shame for our choices or habit, but really just from a place of reflective self-love. Yeah. And if we could all, I think, make make all the choices of our life with, <laughs> with that as the backdrop, maybe it would be a better, a better, a better place for all of us to live in, mm. right? That's I right. love that. Well, Ellen, thank you so much. Um, this was so meaningful to me personally. Like I said, um, your your book um, just kind of shone a big bright light on a lot of things for me and changed so much of my thinking. So it was a real treat to get to talk to you and to have you on the podcast and dig deeper into to some more of these topics. I, I know that, that so many people are going to get so much out of this. So thank you for your time today. Oh, Jen, I'm so glad to know that. And I have so much admiration for the work that you do and having all of these conversations that are really shifting us in this area of life that matters most. And so thanks for doing what you do. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful Dr. Vora could be with us today to talk about mental health. Thank you to our producers, Rivet360, and our listeners. You can find the WorkWell podcast series on Deloitte.com, or you can visit various podcatchers using the keyword WorkWell, all one word, to hear more. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe so you get all of our future episodes. If you have a topic you'd like to hear on the WorkWell podcast series, or maybe a story you would like to share, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. My profile is under the name Jen Fisher, or on Twitter at JenFish23. We're always open to your recommendations and feedback. And of course, if you like what you hear, please share, post, and like this podcast. Thank you and be well. The information, opinions, and recommendations expressed by guests on this Deloitte podcast series are for general information and should not be considered as specific advice or services.